Welcome. I'm Sherry Sager, and I'm the, I have the honor of being the chair of the board for SAMHSA, and I'm also the chief government and community relations officer for Lucille Packer Children's Hospital. We are delighted to welcome you here today to six, the 66th, it's not easy to say, 66th annual meeting of SAMHSA. And like, And like vintage wine, it keeps getting better every year. Um, okay, they're, they're making it easier on me. I don't have the clicker, but it's like, okay. Um, but the next slide's not up yet. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna thank the Sam Seed Executive Committee and the Board of Directors and I know that there a lot of the board members are here because I keep running into them. So if you're a member of the board for SAMHSA, can you please rise so we can say welcome and thank you. <laughs> and one of the things we're trying to do to leave more time so that we can hear the great speakers is I'm not list saying everyone's name today. They'll all be up on the slides and you can read them. But I do want to say thank you um, in particular to, to uh, Randy Smith from Oracle and to thank Oracle because without um, Oracle's generosity, we would not be able to have this wonderful lunch in here. And so Randy, thank you to you and your team at Oracle. And then we have a whole lot of elected officials here and we're gonna do the same thing in an effort to save time. So if you are an elected official or you are here representing a state or federal elected official, can you please stand so we can say thank you. And we appreciate all of the support that we receive from the elected officials and the appointed officials world because one of the things that makes Sam Cita stronger and makes our community of San Mateo stronger is when we all work together on, um, I was gonna say similar, but oftentimes identical goals. When we develop these goals in partnership to move the community and the county forward. So I, um, Speaking for myself, I'm very grateful, but I know that it makes a difference for everyone here. And with that, um, it is my pleasure now to introduce the president and CEO of SAMHSA. Um, I could just say, it, have her walk up and everyone will know exactly who I'm talking about. But uh, Roseanne Faust is our incredible president and CEO. And it's been an incredible year for the SAMHSA staff and, and board. And I want to, as Rosanna's walking up here, I actually want to take an opportunity to not only thank Roseanne for all of her work and her leadership, but to also thank Amanda and Christina. Um, because for a staff of three, they move mountains. So thank you. I was thinking about having a line there about the power of women, but <laughs> with, without further ado, to go over what an incredible year it has been, Roseanne Faust. So let me take a moment actually to reiterate a thank you because SAMHSA would not be the kind of organization that it is without an incredible board of directors. This is my 10th year at SAMHSA. It's hard for me to believe that I started in July of 2008 and many of the board members are still with me and we have new board members. So that is one of the hallmarks of SAMHSA is embracing the past and respecting the past and welcoming the future. So I would really like all of my board, our chair, our executive committee, and all of our board of directors
to stand up so that I can publicly thank you again. So we have pictures of the various speakers up there. And as you notice, I have my Bitmoji up there. For those of you who don't know me that well, it's a way for us to smile. Because Bitmojis are the future. Uh, emojis are the future. Actually, I'm waiting for a few more of them to come into existence. They're missing a few. And I'm sure we have some recommendations. But it's something to remind us actually not to take ourselves all that seriously and just do the work. Do good work and do the work together because that is also a hallmark of SAMCETA. It's a hallmark of every single company and organization represented in this room. You work hard, but you also have fun. San Mateo County has fun. We have great communities. We have 20 cities and a county. We have incredible elected officials. Thank you again to the elected officials. And before I start thanking our sponsors, I do want to acknowledge we have a special group with us here today. And we were sought out by a group that, frankly, none of us in this room would be here without them and that's our veterans. I would like our veterans group to stand up so we can all say thank you. So it gave us, it was a privilege when they reached out and they said, we're very interested in coming to a SAMCETA event. Would you welcome us. And without a doubt, and any of you in the room would have said exactly the same thing. Yes, yes, and yes again. So what I'd like to do now is thank our sponsors. And I have learned from past SAMCETA events, no one likes names being read off of a screen. So I'm going to put up our Platinum Chairman Circle members who really are the backbone of SAMCETA. Then I'm going to follow it with our corporate sponsors and our business sponsors. And I'm going to have a representative from each of the platinum tables stand up, each of the corporate tables, and each of our business um, sponsors to stand up. So here are our platinum chairman circle members. Please stand up and thank you. And what you have up there, there's a wonderful mix of new technology, old technology, of service, of the public sector, of the private sector. There is a really healthy mix. Again, another hallmark of SAMCETA and of San Mateo County. Then we have our corporate sponsors. Would a representative from each of our corporate sponsors stand up? I've thought a long time about how do we do an event to really highlight all of these folks that give, not just to SAMCETA, but give to our chambers, to our nonprofit associations. So what we try to do is please follow us on Facebook and Twitter, on LinkedIn. Please follow these companies. When we come across an article, and there's a lot of positive things happening in these companies and organizations, you'll see the tweets coming from us. You'll see the Facebook posts. But it's a way to say thank you and to honor them for all the work that they do. Our business sponsors. May I have a rep from all the business sponsors please stand up? It's great to see so many people take an interest in what is happening. We have a lot happening in San Mateo County and actually in the Bay Region and throughout the world. We've had you know, the Warriors. Is everyone happy that the Warriors won? <laughs> I, I had to say something that would get somebody yelling. So that was a good thing. 
Um, I'm sure I could say something else that might get people yelling, but I think I'll refrain for now. So our media sponsors, Peninsula Television, longtime San Mateo County provider on cable, local cable access. Peninsula TV is filming today. They will also provide the clips of each of our six Thread Talk speakers that will be out there for your viewing pleasure. The San Francisco Business Times, every single time Samsita has an event, they contact us and say, we'd like to be your media sponsor. So we are grateful for that. I ask you to join the conversation. Here's our Twitter hashtag. So Thread Talks 2018, we try to keep it simple. Last year it was Thread Talks 2017. So if you follow us, join the conversation. We also have an app. We've been doing an app for our various events. We had it for innovators. And now we have it for Thread Talks. And you can download, you can read more about each of the speakers, each of our sponsors. So it just gives you a little bit more information. You can then delete the app when you're done with it so it's not on your phone. But now I'd just like to take a few minutes and talk about SAMCETA. And there's really four, there's four pillars of SAMCETA. SAMCETA. We talk about connecting. So today is an opportunity for us all to connect with each other, with the speakers that you're going to hear today, and with the issues that we are facing. Not just today, but we have been facing them for more than 60 years, more than SAMCETA's existence, and we'll continue to face them. But it's how do we manage them? Connecting, these are all the different organizations that SAMCETA connects with. And while they're not all listed here, I really encourage you to take our annual update. I want to thank Amanda and Christina again, because without them, that annual update is really our pride and joy. It gives you a snapshot of who we are, what we do, and how we affect growth and change going forward, and how we do it in a very collaborative and, I would say, unique way. We convene. So this is number two. We convene groups. I look around this room, and, it, and I'm smiling because I see old faces, I see new faces, I see people who are not on their phones, which is pretty fabulous. Um, that's exciting. And I see people who are on their phones because I know you are tweeting things out. So that's why you're on your phone. But we convene events like this, and we convene with other organizations. So I'm grateful to our chambers and to our nonprofits and to our educational institutions. We contribute. This word cloud is very powerful. And if you just take a moment, and it's on the back of the annual update, if you take a moment to look at the word cloud, and think about some of the words in there. Resiliency, collaboration, innovation. Bus, today you're going to hear from Proterra, which is here in San Mateo County, the electric bus company. Those, that's our future. Energy, you're going to hear about sustainability and energy consumption, or lack thereof, and what the companies in this county are doing. We talk about social media. We talk about engagement. We all engage in a different way. And what SAMCETA tries to do, and I think does a pretty good job of it, is we try to lead. We lead with our connections, with our smarts, with our collaboration. And frankly, we lead with all of you because there isn't anything that you can do by yourself. This is something that SAMCETA put together this past year, and I would really encourage you to go to samcita.org and have a look at it. It's an interactive development map of San Mateo County. What it lists is all the commercial developments and all the residential developments that are happening. We update it quarterly. We will update it in between quarters if there is a large development that comes across our radar screen. So what you will see, and the red arrow points to it, is I'm using Bay Meadows. Because Bay Meadows is an iconic development that really represents the future. It has it all. If you haven't either eaten there, 
at the brewing company or gone to Tin Pot Creamery, if you haven't been over there to look at the housing or seen some of the offices, take a walk. Just go through Bay Meadows and have a look at it. We're also adding in links to each of the websites. So it's there, it's free. We only ask you to put your email and name in there, and then you have access to it. We communicate. All of you, I believe, are on our mailing list, or our email list, I should say. And what we don't do, Samsita doesn't send out a newsletter every Friday. We just have never done that. We send out an e-newsletter when we have something to say, or when we feel that there's information that is important for you to hear. So we're very conscious that your emails are inundated. How many people get more than 50 emails a day? Okay, could probably say how many get more than 100? How many are tired of emails? <laughs> and that is the way that we communicate. So we try not to clog up your box and send an email when there's something to say. One of the things we want to say after this event is we learn from our Spare the Air folks, thank you very much for being one of our business sponsors. How many folks carpooled today? Okay, that's a fair amount. So hats off to all of you. So we're gonna tweet something about that out. So now I'm gonna get into the body of the presentation. And this is Thread Talks. Three years ago, Samsita's annual meeting was always designed to be a policy issue. It could have been about water, it could have been about energy, it might have had a, a featured company speaking, we might have had a congressperson here, and we decided, what are the five key things that really affect all of us? Transportation, housing, regionalism, economy and development. Plus, you can throw in economic opportunity, energy, education, the environment, arts, culture. I mean, there's a whole host of things within Thread that you can really talk about the issues that we're facing and how we're gonna grapple with them. So we have six phenomenal speakers that are gonna come up here and in 10 minutes each, so we have a timer uh, that'll keep track of the speakers, they're gonna touch on a variety of issues. And before, um, the, the first speaker up is Carla Baragno. She is the vice president at Genentech. Her full title and bio is right in the program that is on your table. I recommend, read the bios, have a look. A, this is an impressive group of speakers. And Carla's gonna tell us about Genentech and environmental sustainability. So I'd like to welcome Carla to the stage. Thanks, Roseanne. So I must say, being the first one here, I'm a little intimidated to talk about everything I want to talk about in only 10 minutes. And so if you see me going really fast, you'll know why. I have my colleagues here that uh, are represent our environmental sustainable program, uh, our real estate group, and our transportation. So please, afterwards, if you have any really tough questions, direct them uh, to these uh, folks here. So uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm really excited again to be here to talk about environmental sustainability at Genentech. But first, a, a real brief overview, overview. How many of you have heard of Genentech? Okay, great. So I don't have to go into all of these details. But um, we've been around for um, over 40 years and we're proud to call South San Francisco home and San Mateo County is home as well. It's where our roots are. Um, I do want to share some notable impacts. We invest every year $10 billion in research and development. That's billion with a B. And our impact to San Mateo County has been impressive as well, with over $2 billion of economic impact. And I think we're on around about $125 million spend every year in San Mateo County. And so I think that's really important to note uh, what a difference a company like Genentech can have in the area. Uh, so when we think about the campus, um, we're pretty sizable out uh, east of 101. So we've got uh, over uh, 5 million square feet of labs, offices, manufacturing space in operation, over 200 acres, about 12,000 people that come to the campus each and every day. And the value of this asset 
that I manage is about $2.4 billion. And the reason why I share this with you today is with this kind of size and impact, we really want to be a force for good in the community. And I think we can, with this scale, uh, make a difference. So what do I do? I run an organization called Site Services, and I basically keep the campus running each and every day. So I've got everything from real estate and the long range planning to facilities, maintenance, utility operations, uh, designing construction. I'm usually the one that people call when their parking is getting upset because of construction projects. Um, workforce services, so all of the uh, services that support the employees, as well as environmental health and safety and security. And I'm sure there's a few other things in there that I'm responsible for that didn't make it on the slide. So it's a big job, a fun job, and every day is a different day. One of the most fun parts for me is being involved with our environmental sustainability program. And sustainability is really part of our DNA at Genentech. And it's, you know, being a healthcare company, um, the health and well-being of our employees and the community is vitally important. And at the end of the day, it's really the right thing to do. Um, and so, you know, we think that, um, believe that, a, you know, a healthy future for our global community is one that is imperative and that we can actually make a difference in this. And it's, again, really the right thing to do. And our employees care. So we have an organization called Green Genes that started, Katie, how many years ago did it start? 12. 12 years ago, and it was a grassroots employee organization. It's now grown to over 4,000 members, and it's through our Green Genes and our employees where we tap into their passion and commitment, as well as the company's overall drive around an innovation platform to make a difference. So these employees get together, they look at best practices, they talk about ways to, and ideas not only to uh, further green our campus, but also to ideas that they can take home and think about how they can contribute to environmental sustainability um, at home and in their organization, uh, their respective organizations and communities. So how they're organized is through a group called uh, the Sustainability Council. And these employees organize themselves, it's again volunteer, and the leaders of each one of these committees are actually the business leaders that actually have budget accountability. And they gather these different ideas, and through these ideas, they're able to drive our platform forward. And so it's really a grassroots organization where we tap into the passion and engagement of our employees. And then it really supports what we want to do from an executive level around our commitment on the broad uh, scale. So now what I'd like to do is go through a couple of our big initiatives. These are just a few of the many that, uh, that we're doing on campus. And the first one I'd like to talk about is energy from sustainable sources. And so we have a goal that by 2020, we will reduce emissions, uh, CO2 emissions uh, from energy by 30%. We're almost there. Uh, so we actually think that we're gonna reach our goal by 2020. And one of the big projects that we just recently completed was a six megawatt solar installation. So we anticipate generating over 10 million kilowatt hours um, of energy through our solar program. These panels are on uh, nine buildings, four parking structures, and it's over 16,000 panels. So pretty impressive uh, installation. And with our, installa our solar installation at our Vacaville and Oceanside, which is down in San Diego uh, manufacturing sites, we actually have one of the largest installations in California, and I believe we have the largest installation on the peninsula. And this uh, program actually will support some of our work in net zero energy buildings, one that I'll talk about in a few moments. We also think about sustainability by design in some of our newer facilities. Uh, so we recently opened a building about uh, two years ago, Building 35. This is a picture from one of, uh, I think it's from the, uh, looks like it's from the fifth floor. And uh, this project was really around how we can think about uh, a healthy building and an environmentally sustainable building. We partnered with uh, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, the Flex Lab, where we actually took a very scientific approach to the design of the building. And we actually got to experiment uh, with a rotating bed up in the hills in Berkeley to actually uh, do a performance-based simulation of the design where we were able to test our glazing systems, our furniture, the building controls, et cetera. So a wonderful partnership. We have some information on our website about this. And uh, we actually are seeing the results of that experimentation. This building is 80% 80 
uh, more energy efficient per person than some of uh, the previous uh, buildings that we have on campus. So, so real impressive. Um, we also just recently opened, uh, this was actually just uh, last month, a new childcare center. And that one again is our first net zero energy building. And then also we have a campus community center, sort of like a student union, we call it the hub. And we also have some uh, pretty interesting uh, and new programs in that building. So this is a, a, a photo here of our childcare center, 40,000 uh, square feet uh, for about 375 kids. It's our second center. And again, it's net zero energy. And this is really done through the solar panels on the roof, but also all of the natural lighting. And it was, the sustainability was actually integral part of the design uh, and just a great place for our kids. And uh, we think that's also very important. And then when we talk about our campus health center or our hub, if you will, we also wanted to bring in some well-being aspects uh, to this building. So three of the four floors are naturally ventilated. Now imagine this exercise facilities that's naturally ventilated. We've got this wonderful, cool climate in South San Francisco, so through open windows and fans, we can actually uh, take, uh, take advantage of that. But we also felt that since we have our campus health center in this building, that we really wanted to drive innovation, and we are pursuing well certification, which is a performance-based way of measuring how is this bu building really operating from a wellness perspective. So again, something new that we're doing, and we're also working uh, with uh, well to look at well communities around looking at having a healthy campus as well. Okay, so shifting gears to water and uh, waste recycling. Water is one of those resources for us that is irreplaceable. So if we don't have water, we're not able to manufacture our life-saving medicines. And so we use a lot of water. And so for us, we want to think of really innovative ways that we can conserve water given the situation that we're in these days in California. And we are proud to say that we are down in our water use by 4%, and that's actually with an increase in our production, uh, in our manufacturing facilities. So we look at things, obviously the small things through uh, gray water systems uh, that we have now in our hub. So it collects the water from the showers and recycles that back to toilet fixtures and irrigation. But we're also looking at ways of reusing the water, the reject water, from some of our big utilities in our manufacturing area. And this is driving uh, millions and millions of gallons of uh, water savings uh, a year for us. We're also very focused on waste recycling. And uh, there's a lot of work that's going on in that area in partnership with our janitorial company and also just getting employees to think differently about uh, the waste uh, that uh, is generated through the cafeteria, et cetera. So we all are focusing on those things. And this is a really interesting program. It's called Green Biopharma. So when we think about environmental sustainability in office buildings, it's lighting, it's ventilation, it's maybe changing the thermostat. But when we get into our R&D facilities, it's a whole different ball game because of the large equipment, the fume hoods, uh, the robotics, as well as the chemicals that are used. So this innovative program was kicked off a couple of years ago where folks in our environmental health and safety organization actually go in and partner with the scientists and they look for ways where they can minimize the amount of plastic um, use, where they look at are there other chemicals that can achieve the same purpose that can be handled in a healthier way or disposed of in a healthier way. So a lot of innovation in this space. And again, we call it our green biopharma. Similar to the Flex Lab, we have a wonderful video. I didn't have time to show it to you today, but if you are interested in how we green our labs, please go to our uh, website. Okay, so what's next? Well, we wanna meet our 2020 sustainability goals and we wanna push them even farther. And we wanna continue to focus on healthy green buildings. And I just got the 30 second slide, so I will wrap up. And lastly, um, I think you can see that uh, we're very committed to environmental sustainability from a regional perspective. But when we think about a healthy future for the, the region, I'd be remiss to say that we have to look beyond just what we can actually do in our own backyard. And at Genentech, we want to be a committed partner where we can actually um, you know, partner to make a difference in those really big challenges that are facing San Mateo County and the Bay Area at large, such as housing, 
transportation, and education. And so we're really leaning into this and doing quite a bit. I could probably talk about a whole nother hour on those types of things, but I'll leave you with the closing statement that when we think about these really big issues that are facing the region and the county, we must all here in this room collectively work together to find solutions to make sure that we have a vibrant economy and that we're able to attract the best talent here to the region. So thank you. So I want to thank Carla again for joining us and for all that Genentech is doing on sustainability. And please visit their website because there is so much, especially on education and the impact that they've had with the South San Francisco School District. Our next speaker is Roosevelt Callahan with Year Up and we will kick his presentation off with a video. Houston, we have a problem. We have a growing demand for middle-skilled jobs in the U.S. But companies can't find qualified talent. And that costs the U.S. $160 billion every year. No, that's not a typo. Middle-skilled jobs require more than a high school diploma, but less than a four-year degree. 40 years ago, middle-skilled jobs were the minority. Today, they are a growing majority. Yet, companies are still demanding four-year degrees for jobs that don't require them. Automatically excluding 77% of African Americans and 84% of Latinos. Causing their talent pool to dry up. Companies are struggling to fill middle skill roles because their hiring practices are stuck in the past. And there's a communication breakdown between employers and educators. Schools teach one thing. Companies need another. Companies must evolve how they hire or risk falling behind. Year Up is the key to unlocking middle skill talent. Millions of low-income youth have untapped potential. Year Up gives them the opportunity to shine. Since 2000, we've trained and connected thousands of young adults to middle skill positions for hundreds of happy partners. Just ask these guys. Our training is driven by market demand and the needs of our partners. And now we're leveraging community college partnerships, which allows us to serve even more students and companies. It's a win-win. Companies receive a flexible, low-risk way to gain a competitive advantage. And low-income youth can launch professional careers and showcase their talent to your company. These young adults may have lost the zip code lottery, but they can be an important part of your winning team. Partner up to connect motivated young adults to middle skill positions in your company. Good morning, everyone. I'm Roosevelt Callahan, as, as you saw, and I am the site director for Europe's Bay Area, Europe Bay Area Silicon Valley sites down in San Jose and on the peninsula. I'm going to talk to you today about what we call the opportunity divide. I'm going to dig into that uh, in a bit, but I want to start off, by, start off with a quote from our founder, which I think describes this work. Talent is equally distributed, opportunity is not. So at Year Up, we talk about the opportunity divide a lot. And what we, when, we, when we talk about the opportunity divide, as you saw in the video, there are young adults who have the potential, who have the talent, who have the passion, but not necessarily traditional education skills, education and skills to get middle skilled jobs uh, at a lot of corporations and organizations across the country. Um, so I'm going to dig into sort of what's happening nationally and what's happening locally here in San Mateo County. County. But, but first, I want to highlight one of our partners that we've, been doing this work, that we've been doing this work with over the past few years. So Facebook has been one of our premier partners since 2011. Um, they they did, did a bold thing seven years ago and partnered with Year Up. 
finding ways to bring in diverse talent to their organization that they might not have had otherwise. Over the last several years, Facebook has had a number of interns. They posted a number of interns, <clears throat> a lot of which have been converted onto full-time staff at Facebook, which is really exciting, because these are young adults that would not have had the ability to get entry-level jobs at Facebook otherwise. It's even exciting to know that a lot of our interns, or a lot of our alumni that are working at Facebook full-time right now have been promoted into roles that they're now managing new incoming interns, which is really exciting to see that full circle happen. One of the other cool things at Facebook is that they have a very robust manager support system that comes in and their managers support our interns to make sure they have a, a well-rounded experience. One other thing that Facebook did recently that has helped sort of innovate the way that we work, Facebook helped us pilot a, a new training track called Data Analytics um, that's allowed us to meet market demand, providing the skills that companies are asking for now. I'm going to highlight a couple of young adults who have been working, who are working with Facebook right now, who come from these communities, who, like I said, would not have had the opportunity to do this work otherwise. So Jorge and Samantha came to Europe in July of last year, uh, looking for opportunities to grow, opportunities to learn. Samantha came to Europe wanting to learn communication skills, build her confidence. She's now interning at Facebook. Uh, she works on a team that leads their build-outs of all their conference rooms across Facebook's campus. In her role on a daily basis, Samantha is managing tasks. She's keeping her team on track. She's sending regular status updates and communications to her team, making sure that they have all the information they need to build out these conference rooms. It's been an honor to see Samantha blossom over the last six months or so working at Facebook. Jorge came to Europe with a wealth of sales experience. He's a car salesman. He wanted to learn and grow, be pushed in different ways. He's now working at Facebook as a help desk intern. He's able to apply his sales experience uh, in a customer service capacity, serving Facebook staff members, making sure that they have this, the tools and the skill and the resources they need, and helping problem solve their issues. It's been an incredible honor to visit both Samantha and Jorge on site at Facebook and see them in action, see the work that they are doing, see the light that they bring, the passion that they bring to the organization every day, to meet with their teams, to hear all the overwhelmingly positive things that they're doing and how excited the teams are to have them on site. Samantha, both Samantha and Jorge will be graduating in July of this year, um, along with 200, more than 200 of their colleagues across the Bay Area who are all equipped with the grit, the skills, the internship experience, and ready to apply that to any organization or team across the Bay Area. So I also want to talk about our alumni. We have a number of alumni across the country right now, working in roles in all across sectors and industries, doing really cool things. And I'm going to highlight two that are still working at Facebook and who have continued to commit their talent, their passion, their energy to Facebook. So Esmeralda, came to Europe <clears throat> looking, thinking that Europe was a bridge to get her to the career that she wanted. She wasn't sure where to go. She wasn't sure how to navigate the system. Her goal was to become a project manager. And then to quote Esmeralda, if you keep your eye on the prize and if you keep your eye on the light at the end of the tunnel, you will achieve your goal. And Esmeralda achieved her dream, her dream of becoming a project manager at Facebook which has not only had a life-changing impact on her, but it's also had a life-changing impact on her family. I'm going to share a little bit about Jay Hammonds as well. So Jay Hammonds has been working at Facebook for the last six years. He started at Facebook as an IT operations intern on their Instagram team. Jay has spent the last six years working his way through Facebook and now <clears throat> handles technology management for Facebook's top executives, including Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg. Jay comes from a complicated past, but he was able to persevere through his challenges with hope um, and, and drive and determination. Jay has been featured in a number of news outlets and articles over the years. Jay was most, most recently featured as Forbes Enterprise Technology 30 Under 30 in the last year, which was super exciting. These are just a few examples of the types of talent that are out there that might not have, have access otherwise.
When you think about Jay, when you think about Esmeralda, when you think about Samantha, when you think about Jorge, these shouldn't be the, these shouldn't be the exceptions. These should be the norm. So when you think about your talent pipeline, when you think about, the, when you think about who's in your talent pipeline, we, want to, we, we hope that you're thinking about people who may come from a different background or have different education skills or not, not the skills that you're, you're used to because there, there is talent out there. As you saw in the video earlier, this is what we call the opportunity divide. There are a number of young adults that have untapped potential but don't have the access. There are a number of jobs that are out there that are requiring things like four-year degrees that they may not be qualified for. Year Up is committed to bridging the divide between these two, connecting young adults to the jobs that are out there. If you want to laser into San Mateo County, there are a number of young adults who are in this pool here in San Mateo County today who don't have the skills and the education but have the talent. And I think the folks in this room have the ability to connect to these young adults in the way that we haven't in the past. So I'm going to close with a quote, and this is a quote from Sheryl Sandberg that I think speaks to the, the importance and the impact of this work. Um, so I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your attention, and I hope that you all want to partner with Europe as we move forward in closing what we call the Opportunity Divide and moving the mission forward. Thank you. Roosevelt for all that you're doing with Europe. Thank you to Facebook for engaging with an organization like Europe. And please, all of you in the room, maybe take a moment and speak with Roosevelt after. It's about connecting. I'd like to now bring up Shelly Doran, the vice, senior vice president at WebCore Builders. We're going to get a bird's eye view into building. There's been a little bit of that happening in San Mateo County, and Shelly's going to go into some of it. Thank you, Roseanne, and thanks everybody for coming today. Isn't Roseanne amazing? She does a great job with Sam Cita, so thank you, Roseanne. Yeah. So I'm going to make this a rhetorical question because we don't have a lot of time, but look at these structures. What do they have in common? UC Merced, LaGuardia Airport, Doyle Drive at the Golden Gate Bridge, the Long Beach Courthouse, and Santa Clara Valley Water District Groundwater Injection, what could they possibly have in common? Well, today, I'm here to talk to you about public-private partnerships, because all of those projects are actually a result of a public-private partnership. And I'm Shelley Dorn with WebCore Builders, and today I'm going to talk to you not as an expert on P3s, but talk to you as an advocate on public-private partnerships and let you know what you can do as, uh, as companies and citizens to actually promote P3s in the region. We're going to talk a little bit about what the P3 is, why do we do them, what's relevant about them, and I want to really show you some schedule comparisons. This is kind of the geek out part of it, where we're going to geek out on a little bit of schedules, show you some delivery options, and then I'm going to give you a quick case study of uh, UC Merced, University of California at Merced, which is the largest social infrastructure project in the country. And it's a $1.3 billion project. And uh, WebCore Builders, we are building this project under private partnership. And then we'll talk about a couple other projects. So what is a public-private partnership? It's a contractual agreement between a public agency and a private entity that allows for greater private participation in delivery and financing of public projects. So it's more than a traditional design build, if people understand what design build is or design bid build is. I want to talk to you about why do we do them. And this is where the, it's really important for everybody in the room to understand. We were actually delivered a big pot of gold last week when Facebook and the plenary group announced through San Mateo County Transportation Authority that they were going to be pursuing the, the rail bridge across Dumbarton under a public-private partnership, which is a huge breakthrough. And it's hugely important for the transportation and the 101 corridor congestion. So that was what we were delivered last Friday. We're thrilled about this, so my presentation couldn't be any more timely. Why we do them, it's very simple. We have aging infrastructure in this country. We have aging courthouses. We have aging water wastewater facilities. We have aging airports. There's really a lack of capital improvement money in a lot of our agencies, 
And by that, I mean, when uh, agencies look at capital, they look at capital improvement to invest, but they also have to look at maintain. Well, sometimes that maintenance gets deferred. So there's all this deferred maintenance cost because other things have to be built and things get put off. Under public-private partnership, the deferred maintenance is actually solved. There's also the entitlement process, and a lot of agencies have to go through really elaborate entitlement processes. It takes them a long time. It takes a lot of staff time. It takes a lot of backing. So the, the private sector is able to help the public sector push through some of these issues in entitlements. Part of that, too, is things like local hiring, uh, building you know, veterans hiring, looking into the communities and getting all the communities engaged with, with hiring and best practices. And it's actually just building community. And then thirdly and lastly, which is really important, is the expedited delivery of these projects. So projects that may be on a capital book for 20 years, the, the private sector may be able to deliver them in just third of that time, a half of that time, depending on what the project is. So those are all options to explore when you're talking about public-private partnerships. And I give you a quick, this is the geek out slide, a quick snapshot of this is actually something current. It's the rebuild of the Los Angeles Civic Center. And so LA is being very progressive in their public-private partnerships. They actually have a very large program at the Los Angeles World Airports at LAX for having their new terminal expansion, their people mover, and their large consolidated rental car facility built under public-private partnership. This is for the Los Angeles Civic Center. It's a current project that's going to be coming up. And this just illustrates to you the difference between a traditional design bid build project a design build project and a public private partnership which is design build operate design build finance operate and maintain and a little bit about what that means is this means that an entity is going to take on this project they're going to build the project with private dollars the agency will then give them payment maybe we'll call it rent payment for a certain amount of years and then this uh, private agency uh, maintains it, operates it for that amount of years, and then they hand it back in the same condition as day one. So, so it takes a lot. It's a lot of effort to do this because once your construction costs are fixed at day one, those costs have to go through the life of the project. And then this little thing called operate and maintain, those people have to figure out how to maintain this facility for 30 plus years. So that's when I say a light bulb is not a light bulb or a door hinge is not a door hinge because if you forget a light bulb in that scenario and you need like 30 light bulbs at $300 a piece, you're gonna be out a lot of money. And actually that was what was factored into Doyle Drive entering the Golden Gate Bridge. They had to figure out how to maintain that section of Doyle Drive for 30 years. So that's when a light bulb isn't a light bulb isn't a light bulb. Uh, another little geek outside, this is really how a, um, a delivery structure works. There's a developer, uh, there's the city, which is the city or the agency, there's a developer, there's a design build contractor, which the contractor takes on the design risk, there's an operate and maintain contractor, and then there's a debt and equity portion of the projects. These get very complicated, and a lot of the cities are learning how to work within this structure, but this is a basic structure of P3. So now, I actually want to give you a real life scenario of P3 in action. This is uh, University of California at Merced. You, UC Merced was founded in 2003. It was the vision of Governor Davis, and he was looking at placing what they call the Overflow University in the Central Valley to give opportunity for students, first-generation students, gen first generation in their family to go to college. And what they found at UC Merced was you can deliver one building at a time, one building at a time, but you're not really taking care of the needs of the university as a whole. So in 2013, the president's office of the UC um, named UC Merced as the first campus to look at public-private partnership to build out in totality the rest of the university. They have about 3,000 students there right now, and in 2020, they will have 10,000 students. So this was done under a public-private partnership solicitation. 
with capital cost, our construction cost of $1.3 billion, but an overall cost of $3 billion. Um, the, our equity partner is the Plenary Group, which is a global P3 developer. Webcore is the builder, and then we have several architects, but Skidmore Owens and Merrill is our, is our major architect, and uh, Johnson Controls is our O&M provider. I'm going to skip over the schedule a little bit because I want to show you the enormity of this project. So here's this 243-acre cow field, and this is what it's turning out to be. It's going to be 16 buildings, three sports fields, a field house, 2,500 student housing beds, dining commons, and computational and research labs built in four years with private money. So this is just really a big feat. This is going to be turned over. The first delivery, which are the dining commons and 1,700 beds, will be turned over in July 1st. And we started in August of 2016. So this is really quite a showcase in the US for private, public-private university development. Quickly, I'll just talk to you about some other projects that are being looked at around the region. The Napa Civic Center right now is under a P3 delivery. It was just awarded to a developer. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the Los Angeles World Airports are under P3. So this is allowing this huge airport expansion with, with literally just rent payment costs to the airport. And these will all be delivered within the next five years. That just doesn't happen when, it, when you have to actually stick to the uh, public partnerships. UC Housing, now all the UCs are underneath an umbrella where they can no longer just build housing on their own. They have to build housing through the P3. Long Beach Civic Center, and then there are several transit projects that are now looking at P3. So we're really happy about, uh, about the San Mateo County Transit and the Facebook partnership. And I want to look at all of you in the room as advocates of P3. Now that we're seeing that in our, in our valley here that we could have these projects, let's look at what else that we can advocate to deliver projects under the P3 scenario. Thanks. Shelly, and how many of you in the room have been involved in P3s? How many of you would like to be involved in P3s? Let's have more hands up, folks. That's kind of the idea behind this. How many of you are awake? That was an incredible presentation. So I mean, that kind of P3, 2016, and it'll be delivered shortly. Let's, let's give WebCore a hand. Our next speaker is Kent Leacock, Senior Director of Government Re Relations and Public Policy at Proterra. This is the electric bus company. I was very excited because our transit district has procured Proterra buses. Yay to Samtrans. And I was just in Milwaukee, and Milwaukee's public transit is now procuring Proterra buses. So woohoo, Milwaukee. Yay. Yes. Go Bucks. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you. Um, prior to Roseanne giving us that nice little intro at the very beginning and putting us on that, how many of you had ever heard of Proterra or even knew that electric buses existed? Wow. OK, that's amazing because three years ago, if I had done this exact same thing, there would have been a handful of people that raised their hand because there was six of us in California working in a Regis temporary office space. Um, but since you have heard of Proterra, let's um, do a little bit of a quick video overview so I don't have to talk that much. A major shift is underway across America. It's the complete transformation of transit. With smart, connected, clean, efficient vehicles, utilizing new technologies, fueled by clean energy, advanced design, and intelligent planning. Innovating in four advanced research, design, and manufacturing facilities around the U.S., Proterra is reimagining and reinventing transit, driven by a vision to provide clean, quiet transportation for all. Introducing the Proterra Catalyst, the first bus designed and built from the ground up as an electric vehicle. Drawing inspiration and ideas from energy, aerospace, and high tech, the Proterra Catalyst is the best performing bus on the road with zero tailpipe emissions. 
featuring a low-maintenance electric drivetrain, energy-dense batteries, and a lightweight impact-resistant composite body, the Proterra Catalyst has delivered a stunning leap forward in energy efficiency. With the equivalent of 21 miles per gallon, the Catalyst achieves a 500% improvement over internal combustion engines and a nominal range of up to 350 miles. This is not incremental change, this is revolutionary change. The cost of electric vehicle technology is falling faster every year. Based on this trend alone, we envision that by 2030, almost every new bus deployed in America will be electric. Economics will make it the only sensible choice. Proterra is powering this transformation right now. With customers in over 20 states and more than 3.1 million zero emission miles on our odometer, and thousands more miles added every day by transit agencies across the country. Proterra is driving the transportation revolution, changing the way people experience mobility in their communities, creating clean, quiet transit for all. This is our vision and our journey. Join us. Well, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting information in there. And one of the interesting facts is that that video was, as a uh, privately held, uh, not profitable company, that video was made at great expense and it's already completely outdated and it's less than a year old. We now have over 70 customers across the US in uh, probably over 40 states. And the trend is growing. Uh, states like New York, New York City Metro, Philadelphia, um, everything from small, Lexington, Louisville, Kentucky, to big like Philadelphia, like New York City, Seattle. Uh, we're even in Montana, we're in Alaska. It's growing because at the local level, decisions are being made and the policies are being made at the local level that not only do we want to be green, but we want to be fiscally responsible. And the beauty of transit is that they have a 12-year window sometimes longer, to compute their total cost of ownership. And electric vehicles, if you actually own one for a long time, will save you a dramatic amount of money from maintenance, where um, our buses can go anywhere from two years to almost three years before a brake job, a traditional fossil fuel stop and go under you know, 20 miles an hour. Every three or four months might need a brake job. Electric motors have been around forever and they have like no moving parts. If you saw a list of materials for a fossil fuel bus and an electric bus, it's like a quarter because there's hardly any moving parts. So this is what we were like in 2015 as a company. Uh, I knew every customer by heart. Fast forward to now, I can't even keep track of them and buried in there is, in California, is uh, Sam Trans and Santa Clara VTA right down the road as well as San Jose Airport and as you can see, we're across the US, we're in Texas, we're in Louisiana, uh, Florida, Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Minnesota. It's, it's a phenomenon that's just taking place everywhere. It doesn't matter, red state, blue state. As you saw, the electric bus price is going down. That's been piggybacked off of the growth in the passenger vehicle um, electric market because we're going on a kilowatt per hour basis in terms of energy storage. And so our price of bus has dropped corresponding with, oh, that's a, my CEO loves to throw that slide in there because <laughs> as you heard on the video, we're saying that by 2030, we think there won't be any reason to buy anything but an electric bus, but we think it's gonna be sooner. We think in fact that we will reach a point where no transit agency will buy diesel or fossil fuel bus. It will only be what type of electric bus we buy. Because as I said before, the numbers pan out and you have the added environmental benefits and you actually end up with higher worker satisfaction because they're now using as much, they're using a laptop in many instances for diagnostics more than they are um, you know, traditional and handheld operations in a fossil fuel world. Um, this is a, uh, uh, the Center for Transportation and the Environment. This is a study of the growth of electric buses and it almost mirrors Proterra's internal growth, as you can see, it was a pretty flat and low sales 
to the point where it's reaching 10% of the marketplace overall, the market being about five to 6,000 electric buses a year. But think about technology transfer. Think about school buses. The market for school buses is more like 30,000 a year, of which you know, your kids are riding in these, and they're all diesel. And diesel has been shown to be a particularly insidious pollutant with particulate matter. This is a different, somebody else, this is Frost and Sullivan, another um, you know, kind of analyst company that's looking at the growth of the electric bus market and its explosion, not just in America, but across the world. The growth has been dramatic, and it's for all the reasons I talked about. The price has been coming down, the technology is coming down, the energy density in the battery packs is allowing for longer and longer ranges. Last year, we set a world record with a full-on transit bus that could go into service the next day at Sam Trans, and that bus went 1,100 miles on a single charge. That bus was a transit bus, seats the whole deal. Now, full disclosure, we optimized the, the speed for the test, and it didn't have passengers on it, so it was the world's longest test, as well as setting a world record, because the bus went 17.9 mile, miles per hour for the life of that test. So it started on Friday, and on Sunday, I was still getting updates as to how many miles the bus had gone. But if you think about it, that's the world that buses operate in, stop and go traffic, mostly urban, some highway stuff, and as it turns out, our buses actually do really, really well on the highways. Uh, they actually end up getting a, a, a significant uh, range boost by getting up to speed. And it's really spooky to be on an electric bus that is, merges on the highway faster than you know, some uh, low-level uh, uh, internal combustion vehicles. And this is an eye chart that I don't really like to you know, show eye charts, but it just shows you um, in comparison to their fossil fuel counterparts, with electric rates as an average, how much money you can save with electricity as a fuel versus CNG versus diesel, or in a, the instance of a technology called the diesel hybrid, which many of you may have seen diesel hybrid buses saying, you know, clean, clean vehicles, supposedly diesel hybrid. Well, you know, they're, they're, they're as clean as about that much of a time shot because they operate in diesel mode 95 to 96% of the time. But when you're burning hundreds of thousands of gasoline, that extra mile per gallon on a per bus basis is actually real money for transit agencies. So it was a good interim step, much like CNG was a good interim step in some cases, but the future is electric. I was at a recent conference with utility executives, and that's all they talked about, is how the future is electric, and how they are now all in on preparing the uh, infrastructure, because if you see, there's a lot of opportunities out there, renewable, solar, et cetera. Um, and the difference with the transit market is that it's a fleet-based market, so you're having decisions made at scale. One transit agency can decide to change their um, entire fleet versus individual homeowners across an area. So the opportunity to transform transit to 100% electric is in the hands of a fewer amount of people, like, for example, Jim Hartner right here, who's going who's gonna to be doing that himself. Um, and it's, it's also a kind of phenomenon that if you look at what's happening at the federal level and at the home level, you know, fortunately for us, we're in the right place at the right time because a lot of transit agencies out there have been running buses for a long time, some maybe even past their life. So there's a huge opportunity to transition the next generation of transit um, into electricity versus buying fossil fuel vehicles. Oil prices have been depressed we still have a better total cost of ownership. And if you've seen anything, you've seen gas prices go up and down. It's very cyclical. And they're back on the rise, quite frankly. Now, to intersperse my talking again, this is a little bit of the future, what we're doing in partnership at the University of Reno to, um, oh, I'm sorry. All right, you know what? That's going to have to be it for, for another point in time. But it's, um, it's a really cool autonomous thing. Um, and I'm sorry, but I'm just going to have to jump right through it. Got to stay on base. But, Here's something that is available right now, and this is being deployed on buses um, that are out in your areas. They, it's a, called a mobilized system, collision avoidance. Just know that what the, what the video was going to show was buses equipped 
to be like autonomous vehicles, except they have drivers. And we're collecting data because we don't want to prematurely jump into autonomous because we think that there will always be a driver, a need for a driver. He may become a customer service agent, if you will. But autonomy has the ability to enhance safety in the transit world for the passengers, for cars, and for um, what I like to call the connected world where all of them will um, be able to link up at some point in time down the road, because a lot of that technology can serve double duty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kent. And I promise we will show your video. We will send it out to everyone. I'm going to bring up Ken Montgomery, the co-founder and executive director of Design Tech High School, which you saw when you came in this morning. Hats off to Oracle. You had the vision, and here's Design Tech High School. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ken Montgomery, co-founder of Design Tech High School. Uh, like I mentioned, it's right across the street here. And you know, I was just reminded during that presentation is how exciting it is to be to live and work where we live and work, because we used to be, before we moved in right over there, we were in an, an old auto body shop in Burlingame right across the street from Proterra. So our kids have, like, you have really nice water bottles and hats, too, because our kids visited, came back with some of those. So I'm just going to um, kind of just give you an overview of what we're up to at Design Tech High School and some of the ways that we think, you know, that education should go in the future. So this is the old auto body shop. The, um, a lot of people ask me, why did you start Design Tech High School? And the simple reason is, one day I saw a former student on the cover of Time Magazine. So before I was up here in the Bay Area, I worked um, down in San Diego at the Comprehensive High School, a traditional comprehensive school, 3,200 students. And when I was hired, these 15 ninth graders came up to me and said, we want to start a speech and debate team. I said, OK, great. If we do it, we're going to be number one in Southern California. Somebody has to be number one. It's going to be us. So we worked on it. When they graduated, there were 250 kids on the team. They were number one in Southern California. And then I was walking through a bookstore when I was up here, saw one of my former students, Ryan Panch Hadstrom, on the cover of Time Magazine. Um, he was part of Obama's Code Red team that helped save healthcare.gov. And then um, he ended up being Chief Deputy Secretary of Technology at the White House for a while. And so when I was in the bookstore and saw a former student on the cover of Time, that was while I was working at a local high school. We were spending a lot of time increasing test scores. We were the lowest performing school in the district at the time, so it was something we definitely needed to work on. But I just had this moment where we were spending all this time increasing test scores, but then look at the outcomes of the student who was on the speech and debate team. Because I called up some of my former students who were on that team also and found out they were just doing amazing things. And not only you know, was Ryan Chief Deputy Secretary of Technology at the White House, um, another student was a Rhodes Scholar who did a joint degree, a Harvard PhD in economics, he had a law degree. I don't really know how you make that a joint degree program, but he did. Um, another one was a professional DJ. He's been the opening act for Infected Mushroom. Any Infected Mushroom fans? All right, they're going to be in Berkeley. No, they're going to be in Berkeley, I think, in next week. So you can still get tickets. So another one's professional DJ. Another one, um, there's this really cool moment where um, Ryan uh, tells a story that they're in the Roosevelt Room at the White House. Um, President Obama's chief of staff would um, call the different departments together you know, for updates. So this topic was what should go in the State of the Union. So Ryan said, I was you know, in the Roosevelt Room talking about pitching some ideas for the upcoming State of the Union, looks across the room and sees his speech and debate partner from high school, Austin, who's there at the Department of Treasury. And they had this moment where they looked at each other and thought, wow, Monty would be so proud. That was the nickname they had for me. And so, it's just this amazing thing that I started asking, what is it? Speech Innovate's great, but it's not magic. I mean, how come you think you're having these amazing outcomes? And they all said it was an act of creation. The fact that they came in as ninth graders, they set a goal, they worked on it, they created it, it created this mindset, well, that's how the world works. You don't just passively receive it, you actively design it. And so I thought, well, that's what schools should be focused on. These test scores are important, but moving a kid from a basic to proficiency, getting a couple more multiple joints, choice questions correct, might be really good for the school, but it's really not about the next four years, it's about the next 40 years. So that's when I did my doctorate at Stanford, so I had some experience with design thinking. I thought we should have a school that really focuses on design thinking. So that's what led to the start of Design Tech High School. Because we believe that 15 years from now that the world is going to change quickly and dramatically. We don't know exactly how it's going to change, but we do believe that 
this is a report from the Department of Labor Statistics a few years ago, that 50% of jobs will be automated. And so if you think about it, these kids that are 18 right now, or even younger, they're going out to launch into the world, 15 years, hopefully their career is just getting solidified, those careers could disappear. Because here we're talking about legal work, other white co traditional white collar jobs, these jobs could disappear. So what are we saying? That the world's gonna change quickly, unpredictably. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. But we want you to be, go out into the world with this creative confidence that you can design something. If your career disappears, you can design a career for you. So our mission is to develop students and believe that the world can be a better place and that they can be the ones to make it happen. We want our students to have this sense of optimism, the problems can be solved, and then this sense of self-efficacy that, yeah, I'm the one that can do it. And the way we get to that is we have the traditional academic curriculum, so it's competency-based, so the students can't move on to the next standard or the next unit until they meet a certain level of proficiency. And in some ways, that's kind of like a traditional school. We have traditional classes like physics, um, English, world history. The difference, though, is that we say, you can't move on until you've shown proficiency. So that means we have to stick with the kids. You're never giving up on the kid. You're never going to say 60% is good enough. It's, you have to meet this standard. But then we layer onto that this problem-solving curriculum, which starts with design thinking, which is a human-centered way to solve problems rooted in empathy, then moves all the way to entrepreneurship. Because design thinking is great but it's not going to teach you how to write a business plan. So we think when that academic, that content mastery intersects with this entrepreneurship skill set, that's where true innovation will occur, and that's what these kids will need to succeed in the future. And we achieve the, we go for the academic content, we really try to personalize the education for our students, and the reason we personalize is um, a lot of this is based on the work of Todd Rose's book, The End of Average, where he tells a story of how the Air Force, where they're having, they're worried about too many airplane crashes with their, um, with their fleet. So what they did, they thought, well, maybe it's the cockpit. So they, they measured all the, all the pilots, their arm length, their leg length, their height, their weight, and so on. And they said, okay, this is the size of the average pilot, so we should design the cockpit this way so everybody can reach the controls. But what they realized is that that average profile didn't exist. They didn't have a single pilot in their fleet that met the average dimensions of a pilot. So what we've learned, if you design something for the average, you've actually designed it to fit no one. So we feel that that's what's been happening in education, that a lot of times things are designed for the average. So what have we done? The schools and classrooms, who do they fit? No one. So the solution is you have to make the cockpit adjustable. And once the Air Force realized that and started making the cockpit adjustable, the number of accidents decreased dramatically. So that's what, we're, our, that's what we're trying to do at Design Tech, because we believe there are some core principles. One, that traits are a myth, this idea that you are introverted or extroverted or honest dishonest, whatever, those traits are a myth and they're re very, very heavily dependent on context. That you might be extroverted at work, introverted at home. You might be introverted in a business setting, extroverted in a casual setting. So the traits, and the research backs this up, it's a myth that the context is heavily dependent on the traits you display. So if we can change the environment, different traits will come out. There's also, no matter what you read with all the parenting books out there, that says your child should be taking this many steps and crawling this many miles per hour at a certain age and knowing this many words, there's no single normal pathway of human development. It just doesn't exist. It's all out there in different paces and different ways for every, every human and every form of development. So if we're designed for the average and these are the facts, it's not gonna fit anybody. So what do we do? We hold our students to equally high expectations, but we have different pathways to reach those expectations. So what we're doing across the street there, one of the things is that we're really trying to make the school adjustable for the students. The pace, the way they differ, um, demonstrate proficiency, the learning, the um, ways that they might learn, small group from the teacher, direct instruction, so on. We're trying to create an adjustable school. But really what I love about our students, this is a uh, koi fish, it's our unofficial mascot, we're the D-Tech Dragons. But um, we talk a lot about the koi fish. I tell a story of how if you, the koi fish will grow to the size of its environment. If you put it in a small, small bowl, it's gonna stay small. If you put it in a big pond, it's gonna get huge. So with limitations, you can't put it in the ocean and have it turn into a blue whale. But we've all seen those pictures of somebody out fishing. Wow, I caught a goldfish and it's this big. So what I tell the students 
is that we're going to put you into these situations, we're gonna put you in an environment that you're not ready for, but you are going to grow to the size of your pond. And right now, we are in a really big pond here on the Oracle campus, because right now we're in intercession, so we have about 100 students in the Oracle Conference Center being taught things by Oracle employees. We have other experts, other professionals over at the school teaching the classes during our intercession, which happens four times a year uh, for two weeks each. And that's also when the students learn design thinking. And because we believe that every student has some potential inside of them, and our job as educators is to unlock their potential. This is a keychain that was laser cut by, she's a sophomore um, student now. Uh, and the student came to us, she had no interest in making or anything like that. I said, why don't you go and um, laser cut something? And she did that, and now she, um, she made a gift for her mom, and ever since then, she's just been laser cutting like crazy. And um, it's because there's, we really feel that that's, there's these lost, there's research shows there's lost Einsteins out there. And the lost Einsteins are the, the people that tends to be low income, women and minorities, who have the capacity to be inventors and entrepreneurs, but are not at the, at the same rate. So this is an example of a wearable technology class, which is happening in room 202 right now. Um, these are two students. Uh, they're building something. Um, you can see it's wearable technology. It's a hairband. The student on the right, she's a senior now. Um, she wants to be a computer engineer. When she came in, she came to an Oracle class and signed up for Raspberry Pi, went in and said, where are all the baking materials? And I said, oh, Raspberry Pi is actually a small computer? OK. <laughs> That's not exactly what I thought was going to happen. But she signed up for it. She stuck with it. And now she's graduating with the idea, with the intent to be an engineer. And we say this, this is an example of the, the lost Einsteins and putting the kids in these big ponds that they can grow to meet the expectations for. And these are a couple of our students who are working on a patent for a pickpocket-proof purse. Uh, they're presenting at Open World. Um, again, that was, they get the, the, ca the counseling, the mentorship, build their social capital from the Oracle employees. And we feel that with this personalizing the education for the students and putting this in this big pond, giving them the support to grow, that it really is going to make a big difference for the kids for the future. And I just have to say, if you really want to know the mechanics of how to put, if any of you are thinking, how do I put a school at my place of business? In the front row, we have Randy Smith right here, Randy and Pat and Jonathan. They are really the ones that have made this, this whole thing work as far as getting the building built. And Jonathan can tell you everything you need to know about, wow, what do you do when 550 high school students show up on your corporate campus? <laughs> so thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Ken. I love the concept of lost Einsteins. How many of you in the room feel like you're a lost Einstein? <laughs> there are some. I, I know hands are going to go up. Our final speaker today, what would be an event without some political information? Ben Tolchin is our pollster extraordinaire. He worked on Bernie Sanders' campaign, and he's going to close it out for us today at Thread Talks. Thank you, Ben. And thank you for having me here today. Thank you. So uh, I should note, um, th uh, Roseanne, I'm, I do polling for Sam Cita as well as Bernie Sanders and a bunch of other candidates as well as the Honorable David Canepa. Hopefully he's still in the audience. Uh, th uh, so uh, and Roseanne invited me here to kind of tap into my national expertise as well as local expertise. And I gave a lot of thought about um, you know, what to talk about. Do I talk about the challenges facing the polling industry post-November 2016, which are legitimate? Uh, although we were quite accurate that cycle when a lot of other pollsters got it wrong. But then I was like, what about California politics? But after June, quite frankly, the governor's race is pretty much a done deal. Gavin Newsom pretty much uh, having that a lock. Uh, and then I put some thought into questions which I grapple with every day as a pollster and a political strategist. And I realized these are questions which my friends and neighbors in the Bay Area, as well as family all over the country, are dealing with every day post-November 2016, which is like what the hell is going on in the world today and what does it mean for California, San Mateo County? Uh, and this was done before this weekend's G7 summit, right? Where uh, I, I think it I was like, oh my gosh, I'm even more prescient than I thought. So, um, uh, you know, and I, I, I apologize in advance if I'm not quite as upbeat as my previous uh, speakers were. So, uh, but I'll try to have a little bit of optimism at the end. But, uh, but in all seriously, things are, are, are fairly, uh, serious right now. Uh, I mean, it's hard to put a, a finer point to it. Uh, you have Brexit. You have Donald Trump's election in 
uh, uh, surprising success of Bernie Sanders, who obviously can speak for hours at length about that. Um, the rise of right-wing populists in Europe, uh, major economic, technological, cultural, and societal changes. I mean, you saw the, uh, some of the previous thread speakers today talk about some of these social changes. It's great, it's optimistic, but it's having a real impact on our society, and there are trade-offs to those changes. Um, and our politics is becoming more polarized and radicalized, uh, both in this country and around the world. So, um, you know, big questions here, which is, are capitalism-based democracies able to handle these changes? Uh, and I don't have a definitive answer for you, but we'll kind of brainstorm with you today about some things about uh, how we kind of get out of this morass. But uh, I think there's one data uh, slide in particular I think this kind of uh, helps answer the question of what's going on in the world today. Um, let me kind of skip ahead to this one slide. Some of you may have seen this slide. This was in the New York Times, and it's a slide of uh, income growth, uh, basically historic income growth. Uh, and it was put together by Thomas Pickett. He's a really famous economist about, he's done a lot of studies on income inequality. And basically the gray uh, chart, this line, is uh, income growth by income percentile in 1980. So basically the downward slope of the curve meant if you made less money, you had higher income growth. If you made more money, you had lower income growth. Uh, and I would say that's good for stability and democracy and having uh, uh, kind of a more thriving uh, economy and democracy, a capitalist democracy. Uh, and why was that? Union uh, concentration was higher. You had higher tax rates on upper income. You had more investment in, in education. So you had a, you had a different economy that, you know, four, 30 years ago than you do today. Um, so various reasons in the red line is income growth in 2014, and it's, um, you know, looks like a hockey stick. And what's the, the peak uh, up there? Basically, those in the 0.001% have the highest rate of income growth, and those at the bottom end of the curve have the lowest rate of income growth. And for me, as I've thought a lot about this issue working for Bernie Sanders, I also worked on the mil millionaire's tax in California that successfully passed and raised uh, income on, uh, raised taxes on upper income earners to fund education and other essential services in California, um, that, uh, you know, rising tides lift all boats in a, in a capitalist system and a democracy, but when the tide isn't rising, you have real challenges in our society. And for me, that's what I, explains a lot about what's going on in the world. And again, I had an inside perspective on, on Bernie Sanders' campaign, his message of, uh, you know, a rigged economy. He's going to take on a rigged economy propped up by a corrupt political finance system. I was, you know, one of the um, you know, strategists that helped drive that message. Um, and it had a lot of success, and I had kind of a good handle on why it was so successful, uh, even though he started at basically 0% of the polls. Um, but what this leads to is uh, essentially, um, uh, uh, essentially a very grumpy, angry electorate. This is the uh, data uh, of right direction, wrong track. Uh, essentially, it's a basic question pollsters have been asking for uh, almost a, you know, 80 years now, and you see for a decade the American electorate has been in a very uh, grumpy mood, uh, a sustained grumpy mood for a long time. It's the longest period of sustained grumpiness this country's ever had, right? Uh, and so, and you see the red line is wrong track, the right is right direction. You see a blip up, got the parity only in the aftermath of Barack Obama's election in 2008. So remember we had the Great Recession, people were feeling very, very bad about the country post uh, the Iraq war as a, a, a kind of uh, a challenge of the Iraq war, uh, George W. Bush's second term, uh, voters became much more pessimistic. There was a surge of optimism with Obama, but then as, he, as the country struggled to, to get out of the recession, voters fell back into their uh, 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 grumpy mood again. And, and, and this, you see this, and then you see um, uh, direct correlation to uh, the congressional job approval. Voters are grumpy. They don't feel good about the way things are going in this country. They don't feel great about the economy because the vast majority of them are not seeing their incomes rise. They're dealing with high, higher health care costs, higher cost of college, higher cost of housing, higher cost of living, and their incomes are flat or marginally or not, or not m m m matching the higher cost of living. Uh, they're falling behind, and they're getting frustrated uh, about that situation. And at the same time, as you see in the United States and in Europe, you have this influx of immigration. Uh, of, of people coming from failed states or states that are even struggling even more, coming to places like Europe, the United States, looking for opportunity, in part because of technology changes. Social media, people in the far parts of the world see what's going on. The rest of the world like, oh my gosh, there's a better life out there for me. I'm going to go pursue it. Uh, but 
those people do not look like the people who live in these countries have the last couple hundred years. So there's a real, there's literally a changing face of our society. And if you have a rising tide and a growing economy, everyone's doing better, no problem. In the, in the height of the dot-com boom around the country, illegal immigration was not an issue that we dealt with as pollsters. No one cared about illegal immigration. No one cared about pensions or uh, you know, pension, uh, public employees getting pensions. But you have flat incomes, uh, declining benefits in the private sector, and all of a sudden you have white working class voters who are getting left behind in the Midwest, very, very disgruntled and angry about what's going on in the world uh, and feeling left behind. And, um, and then if you can tap into that effectively as a politician, uh, which Bernie Sanders did from a progressive perspective, uh, but, but Donald Trump did more, even more effectively from, from the conservative perspective, uh, you, get, you get change elections. Um, and, um, and then this is what you get. This is a number of House seats that have changed in elections dating back to 1950. And you basically what happens is once a decade you get a, a wave election, right? You get a, a landslide presidential election like LBJ in 1964 or Richard Nixon in 72 or Ronald Reagan in 84 or uh, you know, a major recession, for example, you get a change election. But you see what's happened in the last several years, you've had massive amounts of volatility and changeover. You had 2006, a reaction against the Iraq war and George Bush. 2008, Obama's election, change election. 2010, a reaction against Obama and, 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 and the ACA and the Obamacare. Uh, and now I believe we're poised for another wave election this fall. Um, you know, with, with Democrats poised to win back the House. Uh, we'll see if that uh, wave comes, but I feel uh, I'm pulling a lot of these congressional races and feel pretty good about it. So you have a lot more political volatility in an era where incomes aren't increasing and voters are increasingly frustrated. Um, and uh, you know how, what, how it boils down to California and San Mateo County. Look, California is a Democratic state. Our coalition, the Democratic coalition, and the Democratic pollster is uh, you know upper middle class, well-educated Caucasians, Latinos, and, and African Americans, voters of color. Well, California, there are a lot of those segments of the electorate, right? Go to Ohio. I'm working uh, in Senate, U.S. Senate race in Ohio. Uh, not we're missing many factions of that. Uh, coalition. So California is going to remain blue. Gavin Newsom is going to be the next governor. Uh, you know, Steve Poizner could be the next insurance commissioner. I said Democrat is going to uh, win every statewide race. Although he's gonna, he he left the Republican Party because of the demise of the Republican Party, switched to insurance uh, independent. He could buy himself onto the insurance commissioner. But other than that, uh, Democrats are going to pick up a lot of congressional seats and the and the two third when likely went back the two thirds supermajority in the state legislature. Uh, in terms of San Mateo County, the impact here. Essentially, you're a victim of your own success. You have a thriving economy, a vibrant economy, a diverse economy. So what are the pressures here? We're working with Sam Cedar to solve some of them. Transportation, you have a lot of people working. You got a lot of traffic. You got some real challenges on gridlock and traffic. Uh, growth, you know, people grumbling about growth and too much growth. Um, and the cost of housing, of course, because you have a good economy, people making good money, and they can pay more and more for houses. So uh, you know, the good news is things are going well for you in San Mateo County. Uh, the challenge is uh, you're facing, uh, how do you solve these problems? Uh, the Sam Cita, I'm working with Sam Cita, uh, voters are realizing these are problems, that, and they're starting to throw money at it. So they're starting to pass transportation measures, so hopefully we'll be successful this November. Uh, in housing, same thing, although uh, I would say if the boom continues, there could be a backlash against development. But um, anyway, hopefully this explains the craziness that's going on in the world. I can't explain Trump, sorry. But, um, uh, but, uh, but I can, hopefully this provides a little more context of why he got elected and what it looks like moving forward, which is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but I'm glad to hear from my previous speakers. There's a lot of things to be good about. Let's focus on the, 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 those projects, uh, but stay, uh, you know, uh, Stay close attention, pay close attention to the news and do what you can to get active and we'll see if we can weather the storm. But thank you. Thanks a lot, Rosie. I was hoping Ben could explain President Trump, but that's okay. Um, that'll be for the next time. I want to take this opportunity to actually thank all of our speakers again. We want to thank Carla and Roosevelt, Shelley, Kent, Ken, and Ben, because the idea behind Thread Talks, you have heard a lot of information in 63 minutes. And that's how long the, the speakers took. So with 63 minutes, what are you gonna do with it? That's the question. We give you all the information. We try to bring up really unique and different speakers, people that you haven't heard from before on topics that you haven't heard, but now it's up to every single person in this room 
to go out and take that information and to deploy it. Deploy it in your businesses, in your organizations, with your friends and neighbors, and really go out because we want San Mateo County to continue being a place to live, to work, to prosper. We want to be a healthy region, but we have challenges. And so this, this is our SAMCETA's 66th annual meeting, and it's our call to action. So have a great rest of the day. We have an event coming up on September 24th which we co-sponsor with the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce. It's our annual golf tournament. It's a lot of fun. We encourage you to think about it. It's at the Stanford Golf Course, which is not a place that everyone can play. So um, please come back and thank you all for attending today. Have a great rest of the week. It's a good way to start a Monday. Thank you.